Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, today, we're delighted to have Mr. Ulrich Bozier uh, at Google. He is the senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, where he writes about education uh, and founded the Center's Science of Learning Initiative. He's here today to, to discuss his third book titled Learn Better, Mastering the Skills for Success in Life, Business, and School, or How to Become an Expert in Just About Anything. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Ulrich Bozier. So I'm up here because I wrote a book on the science of learning, and it's gotten some nice attention. It's been featured at NPR and The Atlantic, Wired, Scientific American. And it makes a pretty simple argument. For a long time, we've assumed that the ability to learn was a matter of intelligence, right? Sort of raw smarts, intellectual power, sort of cognitive horsepower. Right? And this is what IQ tests are really supposed to measure. Uh, your ability to reason through new problems, to acquire expertise. But what we know now, right, is that we can get much better at learning, right? And there's specific tools and strategies that allow us to acquire expertise at, at much greater rates. And in this way, right, we can think about uh, the skill of learning to, to learn really as a way to artificially improve our uh, intelligence. So I first got interested in this topic as a little kid, that's me. And I really had a hard time learning in school, uh, was in special education, uh, I repeated uh, kindergarten. I uh, had one experience that I talked about in the book where you know it was a 45 minute class in math and I managed to be unable to read my own handwriting. Uh, I cheated off my neighbor. You know, eventually I acquired some of the skills of, of learning. Uh, some just sort of came to you as, as came to me as they come to, to many of us over time, you know, started thinking about thinking. But this is really what sparked my interest in learning overall, right? Uh, and since for the past like 20 years or so, on and off, I've been writing and, and researching uh, about education. So we're going to start a little bit with some quizzes. Uh, we're going to have a lot of quizzes. What's the capital of Australia? So I had this question posed to me, um, and it was embarrassing, right? It was like a researcher uh, was posing the question to me, and I was like, I, I should know the answer to this, right? And you know, I thought Sydney first. I was wrong. Melbourne, I was wrong. Uh, the answer is C, as uh, we have some folks uh, here who, who mentioned it. Um, so I'm going to you know, up the ante a little bit here, since you, know, you guys knew quickly, or at least some of you knew the, the uh, answer to the capital of Australia to um, the Immaculate Conception, right? So the question here is, what does the Immaculate Conception you know, revolve around? Uh, here, my first answer was A, was uh, Jesus, right? I mean, that's sort of the, the popular conception. And I'll acknowledge here at the, the front end that uh, you know, this idea is, is you know, specific to Christianity and within a cultural context. But it turns out, right, that the answer is, is A, right? The Immaculate Conception actually is all about Mary. It is not about, about Jesus. So researchers call this the hypercorrection effect. And what's interesting about it is the more confident you are in your answer, and then you're shown to be wrong, the more likely you are to have learned and to retain that information into the future. Right? And so what I find interesting about this is that I think a lot of people think about learning and sort of think about the brain like it's a computer. Right? There's data out there, and the data sort of comes to you, and maybe you process it, and you put it into to little boxes. Right? But if that were true, right, if the brain functioned in that way, you wouldn't have a hypercorrection effect. Right? I mean, errors would mean that you're actually not learning. But what we see from something like this is actually the more wrong that you think that you, the, the more wrong that you are, right, the actually more that you, that you learn. And so when we think about this, you know, and this kind of brings us to this sort of first lesson, is that learning is sense making, right? That it is, our brain is not like a computer and we have to make sense of material, right? And a lot of research makes this true and, and it also helps us think a little bit about certain study strategies. So over the past, you know, 10 years, we've seen a wealth of evidence show that some really common study strategies, common tools for people to learn aren't that effective. So rereading, right? Not that effective. Highlighters, right, which we see in like office buildings and schools. I work uh, often in a law library. You know, not only do these students um, have lots of highlighters, they have different colored highlighters, right? And I really want to go to them and be like, there's actually no research behind, behind those, right? Underlying is the same thing. So on the other side, so what is sort of sense making, right? And examples of that is something like self-explaining. 
right? Which is sort of really a form of quizzing, which is why we're going to have a lot of quizzes as uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking um, up here. And you know, this is an example. This is a guy named uh, Brian Ross. He was um, a professor for a long time at the University of Illinois. He got an opportunity to take an artificial intelligence uh, class, and you can imagine, right? He took it with other undergraduates, and he knew very immediately, like you know, he stood out, right? He's sort of you know older, balding, but he really wanted to do well in this class, and so what he did was just engage in a lot of self-explaining. Basic idea is this, right? At the end of a page, at the end of a paragraph, at the end of a sentence, is to explain to yourself what exactly you're learning. The approach shows a lot of effectiveness in the, the research. And for you know, Brian Ross himself, you know, he wasn't able to code as well as some of the other students. They had a lot more prior knowledge. Um, but he was able to learn a lot more. In many instances, he actually just simply understood a lot more than the other, other students. And when we think about learning as sense making, right, as a way of sort of actively engaging material, you know, another thing uh, makes sense is explaining something to other people. So researchers, you know, really love to name things specific in uh, psychology. This is now known as the protege effect, right, and explains why explaining something to someone else is actually like a really effective way to learn. So an example of this is Richard Feynman, might be familiar to many of you, one of the most well-known uh, successful physicists, um, you know, sort of the uh, modern times. And he once had his boss, the uh, uh, provost at Caltech, come to him and was like, look, um, we're not entirely sure sort of how half particles uh, obey um, this form of, of Dirac statistics. And Feynman was like, okay, you know, I I'm gonna figure this out. I'm gonna explain it to a bunch of freshmen. Comes back a few weeks later, he's like, I can't actually explain this to them, and that means we don't really understand it. So I really just want to make clear that, you know, testing yourself is a really fantastic way to, to learn. This is a study done by uh, Jeff Karpicki, and what you can see here is, you know, you see the, the study once. This is what many of us did in college, right? You get some text, you read it once, and then you take a test, okay? Repeated study is sort of the more diligent college students. They read the text once, and then they're like, ah, oh, I should probably read it again. So they read it a second time, right? So you can see how they do. Concept mapping might be familiar to, to many of you, right? But this idea that you're trying to uh, create relationships, right? So uh, spokes and hubs. Um, so we see that uh, doesn't do quite as well as repeated study. Uh, and then you see retrieval practice. So retrieval practice is the word that psychologists use for this idea that you're just pulling things out of memory. So what these students did was simply to have an open piece of paper and they were told to recall the information that they had just read. And as you can see, they did much better than, than the other students. So we're gonna go here to another quiz. This idea is related to the first and you know, the question is, do you block your practice or do you mix your practice? So to put this in another way, would you, if you are playing the piano, do all Mozart on one day, all Bach on the next day, and then a little Chopin on the third day, right? Or in each study session, do you mix it up, right? So in each study session, each practice session, do you do a little Mozart, a little Chopin? Um, so I'm just gonna do a little sort of random calling you. What do you think? Mixed approach, blocked approach? Mixed approach. So mixed approach is the, the correct answer. Most students choose the sort of blocked approach. The reason that this works, right, is actually kind of similar to learning a sense making, right? It actually prevents you from being too robotic in the way that, that you practice. So this brings us to our second lesson. Got to mix it up. For me, I found this, you know, really fascinating. Um, and it gets at sort of this, this bigger issue. It's sort of doing something. It's not learning. Right? You don't actually get better simply by doing something. For, you know, for myself, a great example is driving. I've been driving since I'm 18. I have not gotten any better. Right? Handwriting is pretty similar to me. I've been you know, writing things, write every day, and I have not gotten better since sort of you know, middle school. So I also play a lot of basketball, and my wife and kids were away, and it was just very apparent to me that I was like one of the worst guys you know, out uh, on the basketball court. So I took lessons with this guy. He uh, played for the Harlem Globetrotters. His name was Dwayne. What was impressive to me is, one, I just I got a lot better, not great, but a lot better, you know, just with like two sessions. And it was kind of crazy to me because I was like, you know, I've been writing about education for like 20 years, and still I was sort of skeptical about you know, the power of these very basic things like feedback. And then I started to sort of get a lot more into the sort of science of, 
of learning was like, oh, you know, I should really then you know, use interleaving in my own life. It showed impressive effects. What's remarkable about this is that this has been documented since like the 1970s. It's been documented across different subject areas. It's even been documented in basketball in a study from like 1972 with a, a group of uh, female basketball players. But I have little kids at home, right? And they, uh, you know, one of them is eight. She's studying her division times tables. And you know how they, are com they come home, right? She studies the eight time table on one day. She studies her nine times table the you know, next week. And it's just a very clear example that we really just don't do enough to interleave, to mix up the way that we learn. The other thing that's interesting about interleaving, right, is that one, it needs to be in the same subject area, right? If you're trying to get better at, at knitting, it won't necessarily, you know, you're not going to interleave with sort of coding or diving or whatever else you want to, to learn. But the, the other reason that interleaving is so powerful is that it allows us to understand what's called the deep feature, right? The deep feature is, is really what you want to learn when you're learning. And when you vary the surface features, right, you're going to understand what that basic idea is. And that allows you to engage in, in sort of pattern recognition. A very simple example of this, right, is that you want to learn 4 plus 4. One way would be to do it in, in mathematical notation. You can change the surface features pretty easily by you know, doing it in a word problem, right? Johnny comes into a school, he has four, and you can see, right, where interleaving in that way will produce these, these much uh, greater, greater effects. This is another quiz, quiz question. A moment for you guys to read it over. Great. So, sir, uh, you guesses? So, I mean, the key thing is to commit to an answer, right? We knew from the hypercorrection effect that the more that you commit to an answer, the more that you're actually going to learn. So, you know, me just sort of randomly calling on people isn't me you know, being an effort as much as, you know, we're going to all gain a little bit more from this. Yeah. D. All of the above, right? This is very key idea here, and that is that context really matters, right? It, this could really be from all of the above, right? And the context in which that you read that is really going to change the way that you're going to understand that material. So this gets us to lesson three, right? You need to think about your thinking, right? And researchers call this something called metacognition. And it kind of appears in, in two different ways. One is sort of planning, right? And when you're thinking about your thinking, you're thinking like, will I understand this? What are the goals that I need to accomplish? How am I actually going to measure what I know, right? And then the other is, is sort of monitoring, right? And it is this idea, right, that we are sort of, you know, do I really understand this? Does this come from a dishwasher manual? Or is this really sort of a, a, a you know, from, from a, a patent? The, the key thing to understand here uh, is that we're all overconfident, OK? If you do surveys of people, most people, right, say that they are above average when it comes to driving. Most people say that they're above average you know, when it comes to looks. Most people are above average when you ask them, you know, do they work harder than their coworkers? Right? But we know that everyone can't be above average. Now, lots has been written about this sort of idea of overconfidence as sort of like a key uh, notion of behavioral economics. But when it comes to learning, it's really important right? because our goal is actually to really understand. And there's so many things right, that we actually think that we know, but we don't really know. This happens to me all the time. This happened to me you know, like once a month. Most recently, you know, my kids went to Gettysburg. And I was like, oh, yeah, I learned about that. And I could maybe get through sort of what would be like the first paragraph on like the Gettysburg you know, website. But then when they asked like any reasonable question, you know, who was the you know, general for the you know, North, I, I simply had, had no idea. And fluency plays a big, you know, role in this, the more that you're familiar with something, and you might not, you might, you might think that you know a lot about it, right? Uh, but you end up not, which is, explains why like a lot of people uh, think that they really know how a toilet bowl works, right? Spend a lot of time on toilet bowls. But if I were to ask, and certainly most people, and maybe here, right, really explain the, what the engineering that goes behind a toilet bowl uh, is, is hard for, for most of us. The second aspect of, of metacognition, right, is, is monitoring. Right? And it's sort of an ancillary to the idea of, of feedback, right? which is you know, why Dwayne Samuels, my um, basketball uh, coach, was, was so effective. And you know, really, it is this idea that you're actually paying attention to, to what you're doing. Right? I don't pay enough attention to driving, which explains why I am not a better driver. I clearly don't pay enough attention to my handwriting, which explains why I haven't gotten better at that. But even just a little bit of monitoring can go an incredibly 
uh, far away. Uh, my favorite example here is, is a guy, uh, a neurosurgeon in Canada, and what he did was something very simple. He, for every surgery that he had, he would just write down what went wrong, right? So if he dropped a scalpel, he'd make a note of it. If he miscommunicated to a, a nurse, he'd note that too. And he found you know, tremendous improvements in his performance, not only over the first year that he did it, but over a period of, of 10 years. The other thing about you know, this type of monitoring is, and really feedback in general, is that it's embarrassing, right? So whether I go to see you know, a basketball coach and I'm in my 40s and basically all of his other clients are like little kids, like that's embarrassing. I didn't actually really tell most of the people that I took the basketball lessons with. The neurosurgeon hadn't even, I frankly think, a much more embarrassing experience. He ended up dropping someone's skull during a surgery, about the size of someone's skull, about the size of a quarter, and then had to go to that family and be like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry I you know, dropped a piece of your uh, you know, husband's skull. And, and he describes that as mortifying. And I think it helps us understand like, why we don't engage in enough monitoring, why we don't engage in enough, enough feedback. So we have another quiz question here. I'll give you guys a moment to uh, look at it. So, want to give it a shot? C. C. So, more than five items. For a long time, people believed that C was the right answer. A lot of early research on this idea was, uh, you know, seven items plus or minus uh, one or two. It turns out that is research that was done in the 1950s. What researchers know now is that it's cl much closer to three to five items. Okay. So. What we're going to talk about in this quick lesson is sort of remembering memory. And what we're going to talk about first is short-term memory. If we're going to go to the next slide. Yeah. Looks like we're not going to go to the next slide. But what is important about this idea, short-term memory is really, really small. It's smaller than most people believe that it's going to be, right? So this helps us understand like, why it's so hard to remember phone numbers, right? For a long time, the telephone companies you know, when they first rolled out uh, telephone numbers, they did it uh, with a mix of address and a mix of numbers. So you would have something like uh, Elmwood 935, right? Then the research came out by Herbert Simon and others, 1950s, uh, and they knew it's, it's, you know, seven digits, right? So this would be a number like 472, 60, uh, 78, right? And now what's clear is that the telephone companies realize that short-term memory is even shorter than that, right? Which is why numbers that you really need to remember are like 911 and, and 311. So why is this you know, important besides telephone numbers is that everything you learn, right? knitting, diving, you know, driving, it all goes through short-term memory. And the thing is that short-term memory is so short that we can't hold a lot in it. And this helps us really understand a lot of other things about learning, right? It, it explains why educators are so important, right? You want something to be explained in a way that it doesn't overwhelm short-term learning. It explains like why uh, checking your phone or visiting the internet while you're learning or even engage in like a, a heavy thought process, you know, doesn't work. It also explains why slides, you know, like these, you know, we should aim to have them, you know, very clean, right? Because they don't overwhelm short-term memory. The other side of short-term memory is long-term memory, right? So you process information, it goes into long-term memory. And long-term memory works basically on knowledge, right? It works on, on context, on what researchers call schemas. And this is important for, for learning, right, because there's this debate in learning, like, whether or not you should be able, you should learn any sort of facts if we can Google all the facts, right? So if, you know, Wikipedia allows all the information to be free, should we, you know, learn any, any facts? And long-term memory makes it very clear that facts are incredibly important. So my example on, on this is, you know, I can say, haben Sie heute Morgen geflüchtigt, right? Now, you can immediately look all those German words up on your phone, but it's very hard to actually make sense of them, to really fluently speak in another language, unless you have that basic knowledge of, of facts. So really, it's important that we start thinking about facts as these sort of basic building blocks of, of memory, right? That they are ways for us to engage. And really, one of the best predictors of, you know, can you be better at physics is your knowledge of physics. The best way to become better at chemistry is simply raw knowledge about, about chemistry. You know, when we think about memory, there's an, another concept that becomes really important, and that's this idea of spacing. This is an idea that dates back 
to uh, the 19th century. And basically, we forget. We all forget at a very regular rate. And we often forget about how much we forget. And so there's something called the, the spacing curve. Uh, my quiz on this is sort of, you know, how much of this specific talk do you think you're going to remember tomorrow? 25%, 50%, 75%. So, sir, I'm going to ask you, what do you think? Tomorrow, 24 hours after this talk, I ask you retrieval practice. You know, was it mentioned in the talk? And what do you think is the likelihood that you'll, you'll recall it? What's that? A reasonable likelihood. So reasonable likelihood to me sounds like 50%. Uh, so that is the correct answer. What's frankly hard, right, is that I'm up here and I know that by tomorrow you're going to forget 50%. If you don't revisit anything of it, within a week it's, it's gone, right? So my favorite example of this uh, is a guy named uh, Roger, Roger Craig. He comes across the spacing research, this idea that we forget at a very regular rate. Um, this was about... 10 years ago, and he started creating his own software, then eventually uses some online software to revisit ideas at the rate of forgetting, right? Sort of right at the edge of this curve. We know when we're going to forget something, and if we revisit that item, we're going to remember it for, for longer. So Roger Craig first develops the software himself, then eventually uses an online software called Anki, which is fantastic if you haven't ever used it for this type of, of, of knowledge. And what happens is he goes, uh, and, and the, the thing about Roger Craig that is key to this story is that he loves games, right? He loves baseball, football, and he watched Jeopardy growing up with his parents. So he's like, I'm going to use the science of learning to get better at Jeopardy. Roger Craig goes on to Jeopardy for his very first time. Uh, he goes to Los Angeles. You know, he's there with Alex Trebek. He does so well on his very first time that he wins uh, the record for the first day amount of, of winnings um, on that. He did so well that when he went home and was like in his hotel room that night, he was like, they're never going to call me back, right? Like, I did so well on these types of recalling of facts that he was like, they're, they're just not going to have me on. Now, uh, Roger Craig has gone back on. He's competed against Ken Jennings and, and is sort of one of the, the top Jeopardy champs. Uh, and it is really just using the spacing effect to revisit knowledge at this point of time. And it's really incredibly powerful, right? And it doesn't really take huge intervention. So in my family now, we um, don't do homework on, on Wednesday night, right? One thing you can do to space out learning more, right, is to, instead of doing homework, my kids usually have homework on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You know, take that Wednesday, slide it into Sunday, right? This is a key idea of just spacing out that learning, allowing for that uh, inevitable forgetting. Uh, now, I'm going to admit that this has not made me more popular as a parent. It sort of like causes dips in my, my dad's stock, right? But I tell my kids, like, you're just actually going to learn more. And it's the same amount of time you've spent studying, but you're going to retain it for a lot more from this, this spacing effect. So Roger Craig himself will admit to anyone who speaks to him that like knowing the answer of who wrote the bridge on the river Kwai isn't real learning, right? And it's just sort of a fact that allowed him to do really well on, on Jeopardy. Then the question is sort of like, what really is expertise, right? What is, what is like mastery and, and how do we really want to, to, to learn it? I got really interested in the idea and there's a bunch of really fascinating research on this and that, you know, Mastery, really knowing something is analogies, right? It's your ability to think through in, in systems. So I don't know if any of you uh, ever listened to the, the Car Talk uh, show, but it's basically like two goofy guys and people call in and say, you know, I have a Buick and there's like white smoke coming out. I had a little audio clip of it. But it, it basically it's a call-in show for car problems. And if you, if you listen to the show carefully, what they do is, is crazy, right? They've never seen this. Someone calls in. They've never met that person before, right? They don't know if they're a reckless driver. They don't even know if they're a student or a senior citizen. They've never seen the car before, right? So they don't know, like, uh, does it look dingy? They've never sort of seen what the problem is. And yet they're able to diagnose these problems, you know, time and, and again. So the question then is, like, how do they do it? Right? They do it through analogies, right? If someone calls in with a, a Buick and they're saying it has white smoke, right? They're going through their own mental model saying, oh, you know, have I ever worked on Buicks before? What's the sign of white smoke? You know, how does this, uh, you know, how does this match up with other experiences that we have? And so it, 
you know, when we think about sort of learning and we think about, you know, what we ultimately want to do with what we learn is to apply it in new ways, making sure that you learn in a systems approach, that you learn through analogies, that you're thinking about compare and contrast is, is really, really crucial. So researchers have, you know, found this in topics like, you know, math. Uh, this is also explains uh, the idea of the d deep versus surface features, uh, been able to show it in, in history. And I got kind of excited about the idea and was like, oh, you know, I'm going to take a wine class. Don't know that much about wine. You know, if you think about wine as analogies, I should take a wine pairing class. And what was remarkable to me was that the pairings, right, did give me a much richer sense of wine, right? So going in, understood and, and was presented to me, you know, how did the tannins relate to uh, you know, or why exactly does sort of a fatty cheese reduce the sort of tannins that you'd find in a lot of red wines? You know, why do, uh, you know, uh, sweet wines like a Gewürztraminer you know, like go well with um, spicy food, right? But this is different than a lot of the ways that we would usually engage with sort of, you know, uh, uh, wine, right? I think a lot of people would be like, oh, I need to figure out like, what is a Pinot Noir? Where is a Gewürztraminer grown? When if you really want to use that information and use it in, in new ways, right, you, you have to engage in sort of, you know, what are the, the patterns? Another example of this is, um, uh, so the history example uh, that I prefer is, uh, you know, let's say you want to learn about sort of war. You want to learn about World War II. Uh, you know, you can think about sort of why did the Germans win in World War II? Well, one of the reasons, right, the Blitzkrieg, you know, by definition, the, the lightning attack, was all about speed, right? And then you can start thinking about, like, why does speed help in wars, right? One of the reasons that the Americans lost the war in Vietnam was, you know, because of a, a lack of speed. On the other side, right, the Americans won uh, the Revolutionary War you know, largely through, through speed. And when you start thinking of, you know, topics in this way and making sure that you learn in, in, in this way, it makes for much, you know, a, a richer sense of, of learning. I, um, you know, ended up spending some time with an a ER doctor at uh, USF, uh, and he's sort of a real expert on, on problem solving, right? This is his, his thing, and I, you know, watched him. Uh, this was at a medical school conference, but someone brought in a, a, a case uh, and it was a rare case, you know, it was a man spitting up blood, and he gave some advice around, you know, what is good problem solving. So, you know, one thing that he said uh, was, you know, you need a one sentence description of uh, the issue, right? You want something that you're able to, to Google, right? Another bit of advice that I thought was great, right, is that you need to uh, update your background knowledge, right? So to go visit the Wikipedia site, right? Make sure your, your deep knowledge is, uh, your, your uh, long-term memory is, is rich enough. You know, but the other thing that ultimately is problem solving, at least in this medical context, and really when you think about it, any form of problem solving, it's form of pattern recognition, right? So he has in his mind different kind of scripts, mental models of diseases, and he is trying to match that information, right? Basically a form of analogical thinking to match that information, right, with the information uh, of the you know, patient that's in front of him. So we're going to go to the sort of final uh, lesson, as it were, and and you know what then becomes really important is the process of of reviewing, of reflecting, of revisiting. Um, so here's a you know a, a, another quiz question for us, uh, and the question is you know should a speaker, whether it's me or an educator, you know, how long of a, a pause should they give in a speech to allow people to uh, dwell on a big idea, right? So should they leave? One second, two seconds, or more than three seconds. So how long should the pauses be when a speaker is asking an important question? One second, two seconds, or more than three seconds. So I'm going to ask you what, do you, what do you think? Uh, no, here in the front. Um, all right, let's look, OK, we're going to go to someone else. With the glasses? Uh, more than three seconds. More than three seconds. Let's just say that. The research study dates back to the 1980s. It's actually between three to five seconds. What's remarkable is that three to five seconds is actually a pretty long time. You know, I give this presentation a lot, and I talk about this quiz item, but I actually like, don't even obey by the research itself. right? Like, I have not waited three to five seconds, uh, though I should have, because you know, for the presenter, it's actually kind of uncomfortable. right? It's like a good chunk of time. But when you look at really good speakers, speakers that are much better than me, like Barack Obama, I mean, if you, if you watch him, like, he speaks so slowly. 
And the idea there is, is just people need time to digest this information. Now, at first glance, it seems like it's about working memory, and, and to a degree it is, but there's another thing happening here, and, and that is, you know, we often think that our thoughts and our emotions are separate, right? Or that our body and, and reason are separate, but they're, they're, they're very connected, right? And so we need time to, to reflect. So uh, another way to think about this is, you know, if I had two cell phones, and they're the same cell phone, this is a, 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 a nice study that was done once, and I give one of them the finger, and then I wave at the same other cell phone, right? I will think that the first cell phone, even though it's the same cell phone, is a much worse cell phone, right? And so what happens is my hand giving my phone the finger, it did the thinking, right? My hand did the thinking and then I used that thinking, right? And engaged in it. So this is an, an incredible thing. When you, when you think about it, right? Like our hands aren't supposed to think, our bodies aren't supposed to you know, change the way that, that we you know, reason in, in this way, and yet, and yet they do. And this explains, you know, and I think you know, there are in other contexts we kind of know this idea, like so in the creativity space, you know, people love to talk about that, like you know, you're in the shower and you have that moment of, of recognition, but we need then this, the same thing in the, in the learning space, right? We need these times to reflect all right, we need these times to uh, process this information and allow, in many ways, right, our emotions to become uh, attached to them. You know, the other aspect of reflection, I mean, and we can do this ourselves, this form of reflection, right? So some of it explains, you know, why we want safety when we're learning, right? We see this is really important in schools. This also explains why sort of, you know, moments of solitude are, can be really important for learning, right? It also explains, um, you know, why just even writing about something is a, a very powerful way to learn. And we see you know, experts who really like hone on getting better at their craft. So Pat Metheny is a famous uh, jazz guitarist. Some of you might be familiar with him. You know, really one of the world's best. And after every concert, he'll just spend uh, a good chunk of time just writing about what worked, what didn't work, engaging in this, in this type of reflection. I mean, the other thing about this type of reflection is that it also allows us to, to check our work, right? It allows us to uh, engage in kind of the metacognition and, and make sure that we're, you know, not, not too confident. You know, what's weird about kind of giving this, this type of, of talk is that, you know, the messages that they often really boil down to are not ones that I think many people want to hear, right? So one of them is that learning isn't really fun, right? I mean, you see a lot of games that promise you can, like, learn secretly, uh, that you know, learning is going to be fun. And you know, the research actually suggests that it's the other way around, right? So one of the reasons that interleaving is in a powerful way to, to learn is that it actually makes learning a little bit harder. I mean, and I think an alternative way to, to, to think about this, this was a, a math professor at Princeton, and I was talking with him, and he was like, yeah, you know, students today always are saying you know, learning is fun. The much better way to thinking about it is that learning or, or math is fun, and that's what makes it hard. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> math is hard, and that's what makes it fun, right? So that you're you know, engaging in these types of you know, difficulties is actually you know, what, what makes it enjoyable. And you know, to give other examples of the way that this type of like active sort of harder processing, right? It's also just so easy to slip in these more comfortable ways, right? Whether we're using highlighters or, or rereading. I had this experience myself a few weeks ago where I was like preparing for a talk, and I like had my notes in front of me, and you know, I was just like, I really wanted these notes, and I kept you know basically rereading them, and they were comfortable to me, right? It was like a topic I hadn't spoken about a lot, and it was really the opposite of sort of better learning, right? I'm much better off, you know, putting the material uh, away and, and engaging in that way, right? Uh, another way to think about this is sort of repeat backs, sort of a management tool, but it's essentially a form of active learning. You know, I've done it um, now often, you know, with, with my wife, right, is that if you give someone some instructions and if they're, you know, more complicated instructions, you want them to repeat that information, you know, back to you, right? That's another way of sort of engaging this uh, form of, of active uh, learning. I think, you know, the other thing that's sort of this key theme here is, is that forgetting can really be your friend, right? We often think that forgetting works against us, right? But 
you know, forgetting actually allows us new forms of perspective, right? It allows us to engage in more systems thinking. The key thing to also understand about forgetting, and this is a, a weird concept to understand, is that you actually don't really forget. Right? There's some fun studies on this, is that if I go to you and say, you know, can you remember your high school locker number? I think most people would be like, nah, I can't remember that. But if I show you four digits, right, or excuse me, four options, and of those, you know, one of them is your high school locker number, far more than uh, one might guess, and certainly a lot more than average, you're actually able to, to uh, identify that number. So the question is, if you are able to remember everything, you know, how... How do you actually remember something? And it turns out, right, it's, it's the retrieval. It's pulling things out of memory, right, is it makes them more available, right? And this explains why these more active types of learning, whether explaining to yourself or explaining to someone else, can be so effective, right? They allow you to see these types of uh, connections, but then again, they uh, allow you to have things sort of uh, top of mind, right? They allow you to, to exist in them. And I guess my, my parting thought in this uh, regard is, you know, always, always look for patterns, right? You know, it's so easy to look for this very specific bit of detail, right? So if you're learning about oceans, as an example, right, you'd want to know, okay, you know, what's the uh, temperature of the ocean, right? But if you're engaging in these types of analogies, you're starting to think, or these types of systems thinking, you're going to say to yourself, okay, what happens when the water temperature goes up? Right? One of the things that happens is more vapor is produced. This helps us understand why climate change can be so dangerous, right? Some of the storms are more... Uh, terrible, right? This also helps us then understand why sea levels are rising, right? Because the relationship between heat and water is such that, you know, water expands uh, as, it, as it grows bigger. Analogies, though, are, are difficult, right? And when you're using analogies, using this type of, of systems thinking, you want to have analogies that you know well, right? So the analogy of, like, it cuts like a, a knife works because we're all pretty familiar with knives. And analogies in this same regard is that if you're explaining an idea to someone else, right, sort of like you want Uber for kindergarten or Uber for cooking, right, you're using an analogy that, that all of us, you know, are familiar with. And then the reverse side is that, you know, these analogies that don't work are either sort of quiz problems or they're just plainly funny. And I'll leave you with that thought, which is, you know, what does, uh, you know, Barack Obama and Mount Kilimanjaro have in common? You know, it turns out to be Africa. So... With that, I'm going to thank you again for uh, you know, taking the time to come out here uh, today and, and listen to this, and um, thank you again.